Hello dear comrades today we will be going through the book wage labor and capital by Karl Marx in this book Marx has shown us what wages are discussed the effect of selling labor power and determined how the price of labor is decided Marx is using a very important point that it develops fully in capital this is the labor theory of value so without further ado let's begin introduction to Karl Marx wage labor and capital This pamphlet first appeared in the form of a series of leading articles in the New Rennes newspaper beginning on the April 4th of 1849. This text is made up of from lectures delivered by Marx before the German Working Men's Club of Brussels in 1847. The series was never completed. The promise to be continued at the end of the editorial in the number 269 of the newspaper remain unfulfilled in the consequence of the precipitous events of that time the invasion of hungary by the russians and the uprisings in dresden eiserlohan everfeld the palatinate and in the baden which led to the suppression of the paper on may 19th of 1849 and among the papers left by marx no manuscript of any continuation of these articles has been found Wage labor and capital has appeared as an independent publication in several editions the last of which was issued by the Swiss Cooperative Printing Association in 1884 hitherto the several editions have contained the exact wording of the original articles but since at least 10000 copies of the present edition are to be circulated as a propaganda tract the question necessarily forced itself upon me would marx himself under this circumstance have approved of an unaltered literal reproduction of the original marx in his 40s had not yet completed his criticism of the political economy this was not done until toward the end of the 50s consequently such of his writing as were published before the first installment of his critique of the political economy was finished deviate in some points from those written after 1859 and contained expressions and whole sentences which viewed from the standpoint of his later writings appear inexact and even incorrect now it goes without saying that in ordinary editions intended for the public in general this earlier standpoint as the part of the intellectual development of the author has its place that the author as well as the public has an indisputable right to an unaltered reprint of these older writings in such a case i would not have dreamed of changing a single word in it but it is otherwise when the edition is destined almost exclusively for the purpose of propaganda in such a case marx himself would unquestionably have brought the old work dating from 1849 into harmony with his new print of view and i feel sure that i am acting in his spirit when i insert in this new edition the few changes and additions which are necessary in order to attain this object in all the essential points therefore i say to the reader at once This pamphlet is not as Marx wrote it in 1849 but approximately as Marx would have written in 181891 Moreover so many copies of the original text are in circulation that this will suffice until I can publish it again unaltered in a complete edition of Marx works to appear at some future time My alterations center about one point according to the original reading the worker sells his labor for the wages which he receives from the capitalists according to the present text he sells his labor power and for this change i must render an explanation to the workers in order that they may understand we are not quibbling or word juggling but we are dealing here with one of the most important points in the whole range of political economy to the bourgeoisie in order that they may convince themselves how greatly the uneducated workers who can be easily made to grasp the most difficult economic analysis axel our supercilious cultured folk for whom such ticklish problems remain insoluble their whole life long classical political economy borrowed from the industrial practice the current notion of the manufacturer that he buys and pays for the labor of his employees this conception had been quite serviceable for the business purposes of the manufacturer his bookkeeping and the price calculation but naively carried over into the political economy it there produced truly wonderful errors and confusions political economy find it an established fact that the all the prices of the commodities among them the price of the commodity which it calls the labor continually change that they rise and fall in the consequence of the most diverse circumstances 
which often have no connection whatsoever with the production of the commodities themselves so that the price appear to be determined as a rule by pure chance as soon therefore as political economy stepped forth as a science it was one of its first tasks to search for the law that hid itself behind this chance which apparently determined the prices of the commodities and which in reality controlled this very chance among the prices of the commodities fluctuating and oscillating now upward now downward the fixed central point was searched for around which these fluctuations and oscillations were taking place in short starting from the price of the commodities political economy sought for the value of the commodities as the regulating law by means of which all price fluctuations could be explained and to which they could all be reduced in the last resort and so classical political economy found that the value of the commodity was determined by the labor incorporated in it and requisite to its production with this explanation it was satisfied and we too may for the present stop at this point but to avoid the misconceptions i will remind the reader that today this explanation has become wholly inadequate marx was the first to investigate thoroughly into the value forming quality of the labor and to discover that not all labor which is apparently or even really necessary to the production of the commodity imparts under all circumstances to this commodity a magnitude of value corresponding to the quantity of labor used up if therefore we say today in short with the economist like ricardo that the value of commodity is determined by the labor necessary to its production we always imply that the reservation and restrictions made by marx thus much for our present purpose further information can be found in the marx critic of political economy which appeared in 1859 and in the first volume of capital but as soon as the economist applied this determination of value by labor to the commodity labor they fell from one contradiction to another how is the value of labor determined by the necessary labor embodied in it but how much the labor is embodied in the labor of the laborer of a day a week a month a year if labor is the measure of all values we can express the value of labor only in labor but we know absolutely nothing about the value of an hour's labor if all that we know about it is that it is equal to one hour's labor so thereby we have not advanced one year's breadth nearer our goal we are constantly turning about in a circle classical economies therefore as said another turn it said the value of a commodity is equal to its cost of production but what is the cost of production of labor in order to answer these questions the economists are forced to strain logic just a little instead of investigating the cost of production of labor itself which unfortunately cannot be ascertained they now investigate the cost of production of the laborer and this latter can be ascertained it changes according to the time and circumstances but for a given condition of society in a given locality and in a given branch of population it too is given at least within quite narrow limits we live today under the regime of capitalist production under which a large and steadily growing class of population can live on the condition that it works for the owners of the means of production and the means of subsistence on the basis of this mode of production the laborer's cost of production consists of the sum of means of subsistence which on the average are required to enable him to work to maintain in him his capacity for work and to replace him at his departure by the reason of age sickness or death with another laborer that is to say to propagate the working class in required numbers let us assume that the money price of this means of subsistence averages $3 a day our laborer gets therefore a daily wage of $3 from his employer for this the capitalist lets him work say 12 hours a day our capitalist moreover calculates some art in the following fashion let us assume that our laborer a machinist has to make a part of machine which he finishes in one day the raw material costs 20 dollars the consumption of coal by the steam engine the wear and tear of the engine itself of the turning lathe and of the other tools with which our laborer works represent for one day and one laborer a value of a 1 dollar the wages for one day are according to our assumptions 3 dollars this makes a total of 24 dollars for our piece of a machine but the capitalist calculates that on an average he will receive for it a price of 27 dollars from his customers or 3 dollars over and above his outlay 
went to the three dollars pocketed by the capitalist com. According to the assertion of classical political economy, commodities are in the long run sold at the values, that is, they are sold at the prices which correspond to the necessary quantities of labor contained in them. The average price of our part of a machine, twenty-seven dollars, would therefore equal its value, that is, equal the amount of the labor embodied in it. But of this twenty-seven dollars. Twenty-one dollars were values already existing before the machinists began to work. Twenty dollars were contained in the raw material, one dollar in the fuel consumed during the work, and in the machines and tools used in the process and reduced in their efficiency to the value of this amount. There remains six dollars, which have been added to the value of the raw material. But according to the supposition of our economists themselves, these six dollars can arise only from the labor. Added to the raw material by the laborer, his twelve hours labor added has created, according to this, a new value of six dollars. Therefore, the value of his twelve hours labor would be equivalent to six dollars. So we have at last discovered what the value of labor is. Hold on, there cries our machinist, six dollars. But I have received only three dollars. My capitalist swears high and dry that the value of my twelve hour labor is no more than three dollars. And if I were to demand six, he would laugh at me. What kind of a story is that? If before this we got with our value of labor into a vicious cycle, we now surely have driven straight into an insoluble contradiction. We searched for the value of labor, and we found more than we can use. For the laborer, the value of the twelve-hour labor is three dollars. For the capitalist, it is six dollars, of which he pays the working man three dollars as wages, pockets the remaining three dollars himself. According to this, labor has not one but two values, and moreover, two very different values. As soon as we reduce the values now expressed in money to labor time, the contradiction becomes even more absurd. By the twelve hours labor, a new value of six dollars is created. Therefore, in six hours, the new value created equals three dollars, the amount which the laborer receives from the twelve hour labor. For twelve-hour labor, the working man receives an equivalent the product of six hours labor. We are thus forced to one of two conclusions: either labor has two values, one of which is twice as large as the other, or twelve equals six. In both cases, we get pure absurdities. Turn and twist as we may, we will not get out of this contradiction as long as we speak of buying and selling of labor and of the value of labor. And just so it happened to the political economist. The last offshoot of classical political economy, the Ricardian school, was largely wrecked on the insolubility of this contradiction. Classical political economy had run itself into a blind alley. The man who discovered way out of this blind alley was Karl Marx. What the economist had considered as the cost of production of labor was really the cost of production, not of labor, but of the living laborer himself. And what this laborer sold to the capitalist was not his labor. So soon as his labor really begins, says Marx, it ceases to belong to him, and therefore can no longer be sold by him. At the most, he could sell his future labor, that is, assume the obligation of executing a certain piece of work in a certain time. But in this way, he does not sell the labor, but not for a stipulated payment. He places his labor power at the disposal of the capitalist for a certain time or for the performance of the certain task. He hires out or sells his labor power, but this labor power has grown up with his person and is inseparable from it. Its cost of production, therefore, coincides with his own cost of production. What the economists call the cost of production of labor is really the cost of production of the laborer, and therewith of his labor power. And thus, we can also go back from the cost of production of labor power to the value of labor power and determine the quality of social labor. That is required for the production of labor power of a given quantity, as Marx has done in the chapter on buying and selling of labor power. Now, what takes place after the worker has sold his labor power? That is, after he has placed his labor power at the disposal of the capitalist for stipulated wages, whether time wages or piece wages. The capitalist takes the laborer into his workshop or factory, where all the articles required for the work can be found. Raw materials, auxiliary materials, tools, machines. Here the worker begins to work. His daily wages are, as above, three dollars, and it makes no difference whether he earns them as a daily wages or a piece wages. 
We again assume that in the 12 hours the workers added by his labor a new value of $6 to the value of raw materials consumed, which new value the capitalist realizes by the sale of finished piece of work. Out of his new value, he pays the workers his $3 and the remaining $3 he keeps for himself. If now the laborer creates in 12 hours a value of $6, in 6 hours he creates a value of $3. Consequently, after working 6 hours for the capitalist, the laborer has returned to him the equivalent of $3 received as wages. After six hours work, both are quits, neither one owing a cent to the other. Hold on there, now cries out the capitalist. I have hired the laborer for a whole day, for 12 hours, but six hours are only half a day, so work alone lively there until the other six hours are at an end. Only then we will be even. And in fact, the laborer has to submit to this condition of the contract upon which he entered of his own free will, and according to which he bound himself to work 12 hours for a product of a labor which cost only 6 hours of labor. Similarly, with peace wages, let us suppose that in the 12 hours our worker makes 12 commodities. Each of these costs a dollar in raw materials and wear and tear and is sold for $2.5. On our formal assumption, the capitalist gives the laborer 0.25 of a dollar for each piece, which makes a total of $3 for 12 pieces. To earn this, the worker requires 12 hours. The capitalist receives $30 for the 12 pieces, deducting $24 for the raw materials and wear and tear, and there remains $6, of which he pays $3 in wages and pockets the remaining $3. Just as before, here also, the worker labors 6 hours for himself, that is to replace his wages, and 6 hours for the capitalist. The rock bottom upon which the best economists were stranded as long as they started out from the value of labor vanishes as soon as we make our starting point the value of labor power. Labor power is, in our present day capitalist society, a commodity like every other commodity, but yet a very peculiar commodity. It has, namely, the peculiarity of being a value creating force, the source of value and moreover when properly treated the source of more value than it possesses itself. In the present state of production, human labor power not only produces in a day greater value than it itself possesses and costs, but with each new scientific discovery, with each new technical inventions, there also rises the surplus of its daily production over its daily cost, while as a consequence there diminishes that the part of the working day in which the laborer produces the equivalent of his day wages and, on the other hand, lengthens the part of the working day in which he must present labor gratis to the capitalist. And this is the economic constitution of our entire modern society. The working class alone produces all values, for value is only another expression for labor, that expression namely by which is designated in our capitalist society of today the amount of socially necessary labor embodied in the particular commodity. But these values produced by the workers do not belong to the workers. They belong to the owners of the raw materials, machines, tools and money which enable them to buy the labor power of the working class. Hence the working class gets back only a part of the entire mass of products produced by it. And as we have just seen, the other portion which the capitalist class retains and which it has to share at most only with the landlord class is increasing with every new discovery and invention, while the sear which falls to the working class rises but little and very slowly, or not at all, and under the certain conditions it may even fall. But these discoveries and inventions which supplant one another with ever increasing speed, this productiveness of human labor which increases from day to day unheard of proportions at last gives rise to a conflict in which present capitalistic economy must go to ruin. On the other hand, immeasurable wealth of a superfluidity of products with which the buyers cannot cope. On the other hand, the great mass of society proletarianized, transformed into wage laborers and thereby disabled from appropriating to themselves that superfluidity of products. The splitting up of society into a small class, immoderately rich, and a large class of wage laborers devoid of all the property brings it about that this society smothers in its own superfluidity, while the great majority of its members are scarcely 
or not at all protected from the extreme wind. This condition becomes every day more absurd and more unnecessary. It must be gotten rid of. It can be gotten rid of. A new social order is possible in which the class differences of today will have disappeared and in which, perhaps, after a short transition period, which through somehow decent in other respects will in any case be very useful morally, there will be the means of life, of enjoyment of life, and of the development and activity of all bodily and mental faculties through the systematic use and further development of the enormous productive powers of society which exist with us even now with equal obligation upon all to work and the workers are growing even more determined to achieve this new social order will be proven on the both sides of the ocean on this May Day and on the Sunday May 3rd. Frederick Engels, London, April 30 of 1891 Chapter 1. Preliminary From various quarters, we have been reproached for neglecting to portray the economic conditions which form the material basis of the present struggles between the classes and nations. With said purpose, we have hitherto touched upon these conditions only when they focused themselves upon the surface of the political conflicts. It was necessary, beyond everything else, to follow the development of the class struggle in the history of our own day and to prove empirically by the actual and daily newly created historical material that with the subjugation of the working class accomplished in the days of February and March of 1848, the opponents of that class, the bourgeoisie republicans in France and the bourgeoisie and peasant classes who were fighting feudal absolutism throughout the whole continent of Europe, which simultaneously concurred that the victory of the modern republic in France sounded at the same time the fall of the nations which had responded to the February Revolution with heroic wars of independence, and finally that, by the victory over the revolutionary working man, Europe fell back into the English-Russian slavery. The June conflict in the Paris, the fall of Vienna, the tragic comedy in Berlin in November 1848, the desperate efforts of Poland, Italy and Hungary, the starvation of Ireland into submission. These were the chief events in which the Europe class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the working class was summed up, and from which we proved that every revolutionary uprising, however remote from the class struggle its object might appear, must of necessity fail until the revolutionary working class shall have concurred that every social reform must remain a utopia until the proletarian revolution and the feudalistic counter-revolution have been pitted against each other in the worldwide war. In our presentation, as in reality, Belgium and Switzerland were tragicomic caricaturist genre pictures in the great historic tableau. The one, the state of bourgeoisie monarchy, the other, the model, state of the bourgeoisie republic, both of them states that flatter themselves to be just as free from the class struggle as from the European Revolution. But now, after our readers have seen the class struggle of the year of 1848 develop into colossal political proportions, it is time to examine more closely the economic conditions themselves upon which is founded the existence of capitalist class and its class rule, as well as the slavery of the workers. We shall present the subject in three great divisions. Number one the relation of wage labor to capital, the slavery of the worker, the rule of the capitalist. Number two, the inevitable ruin of the middle class and the so-called commons under the present system. Number three, the commercial subjugation and exploitation of the bourgeoisie classes of the various European nations by the despot of the world market. We shall seek to portray this as simply and popularly as possible and shall not presuppose a knowledge of even the most elementary notions of political economy. We wish to be understood by the workers and, moreover, there prevails in Germany the most remarkable ignorance and confusion of ideas in regard to the simplest economic relations from the patented defenders of existing conditions down to the socialist wonder workers and the unrecognized political geniuses in which divided Germany is even richer than in duodecimo princelings. We therefore proceed to the consideration of the first problem. Chapter 2 What are wages? How are they determined? If several workmen were to be asked, How much wages do you get? One would reply, I get $2 a day, and so on. According to the different branches of the industry in which they are employed, 
they would mention different sums of money that they received from their respective employers for the completion of a certain task. For example, for waving a yard of linen or for setting a page of a type. Despite the variety of their statements, they would all agree upon one point that wages are the amount of money which the capitalist pays for a certain period of work or for a certain amount of the work. Consequently, it appears that the capitalist buys their labor with money and that for the money they sell him their labor. But this is merely an illusion. What they actually sell to the capitalist for money is their labor power. This labor power the capitalist buys for a day, a week, a month, etc. And after he has bought it, he uses it up by letting the worker labor during this stipulated time. With the same amount of money, with which the capitalist has bought their labor power. He could have bought a certain amount of sugar or of any other commodity. The two dollars with which he bought 20 pounds of sugar is the price of the 20 pounds of sugar. The two dollars with which he has bought 12 hours use of labor power is the price of 12 hours labor. Labor power then is a commodity no more no less, so then is a sugar. The first is measured by the clock, the other by the scales. Their commodity, labor power, the workers actions for the commodity of the capitalist for money and moreover this actions takes place at a certain ratio so much money for so long a use of labor power for 12 hours waving two dollars and these two dollars do represent all the other commodities which i can buy for two dollars therefore actually the worker has extended his commodity labor power for commodities of all kinds and moreover at a certain ratio by giving him two dollars, the capitalist has given him so much meat, so much clothing, and so much wood, light, etc. in exchange for his day's work. The two dollars, therefore, express the relation in which labor power is exchanged for other commodities, the exchange value of labor power. The exchange value of a commodity estimated in money is called its price. Wages, therefore, are only a special name for the price of labor power and are usually called the price of labor. It is the special name for the price of this peculiar commodity which has no other repository than human flesh and blood. Let us take any worker, for example, a weaver. The capitalist supplies him with the loom and yarn. The weaver applies himself to work and the yarn is turned into cloth. The capitalist takes the possession of the cloth and sells it for $20. Now are the wages of the weaver a share of the cloth of $20 of the product of the work? By no means. Long before the cloth is sold, Perhaps long before it is fully open, the waiver has received his wages. The capitalist then does not pay his wages out of the money which he will obtain from the cloth, but out of the money already on the hand. Just as little as loom and yarn are product of the waiver to whom they are supplied by the employer, just so little are the commodities which he received in exchange for his commodity, labor power, his product. It is possible that the employer found no purchasers at all for the cloth. It is possible that he did not get even the amount of the wages by itself. It is possible that he sells it very profitably in proportion to the waiver's wages. But all that does not concern the waiver. With a part of his existing wealth, of his capital, the capitalist buys the labor power of the waiver in exactly the same manner as with another part of his wealth he has bought the raw material, the yarn, and the instrument of the labor, the loom. After he has made these purchases and among them belongs the labor power necessary to the production of the cloth, he produces only with the raw materials and instruments of labor belonging to him. For our good waiver too, it is one of the instruments of labor and being in a par with the loom, he has no more share in the product, the cloth or in the price of the product than the loom itself has. Wages, therefore, are not a share of the worker in the commodities produced by himself Wages are the part of already existing commodities with which the capitalist buys a certain amount of productive labor power. Consequently, the labor power is a commodity which its processor, the wage worker, sells to the capitalist. Why does he sell it? It is in order to live. But the putting of labor power into action, that is the work, is the active expression of laborer's own life and this life activity he sells to another person in order to secure the necessary means of life. His life activity, therefore, is but a means of securing his own existence. He works that he may keep alive. He does not count the labor itself as a part of his life. It is rather a sacrifice for his life. 
it is a commodity that he has auctioned off to another the product of his activity therefore is not the aim of his activity what he produces for himself is not the silk that he weaves not the gold that he draws up mining the shaft not a palace that he builds what he produces for himself is wages and the silk the gold the palace are reserved for him into certain quantity of necessaries of life perhaps into a cotton jacket into a copper coins and into a basement dwelling and the laborer who for 12 hours long weaves spin bores stones builds sawbills breaks stone carries hoards and so on is this 12 hours weaving spinning boring turning building sawbilling stone breaking regarded by him as a manifestation of life quite the contrary life for him begins where this activity ceases at the table at the tavern in bed the 12 hours work on the other hand has no meaning for him as weaving spinning boring and so on but only as a earnings which enable him to sit down at the table to take his seat in the tavern and to lie down in a bed if the silk worm's object in spinning were to prolong its existence as caterpillar it would be a perfect example of the wage worker labor power was not always a commodity labor was not always a wage labor that is free labor the slave did not sell his labor power to the slave owner as any more than the ox sells his labor to the farmer the slave together with the labor power was sold to his owner once and for all he is a commodity that can be passed one hand of one owner to that of another he himself is a commodity but the labor power is not his commodity the serf sells only a portion of his labor power it is not he who receives wages from the owner of the land it is rather the owner of the land who receives a tribute from him the serf belongs to the soil and to the lord of the soil he brings its fruit the free laborer on the other hand sells his very self and that by fractions he auctions of 8 10 12 15 hours of his life one day like the next to the highest bidder to the owner of the raw materials tools and the means of life that is to the capitalist the laborer belongs neither to an owner nor to the soil but 8 10 12 15 hours of his daily life belong to whomsoever buys them the worker leaves the capitalist to whom he has sold himself as often as he chooses and the capitalist discharges him as often as he sees fit as soon as he no longer gets any use or not the required use out of him but the worker whose only source of income is the sale of his labor power cannot leave the whole class of buyers that is capitalist class unless he gives up his own existence it does not belong to this or that capitalist but to the capitalist class and it is for him to find his man that is to find a buyer in the capitalist class before entering more closely upon the relation of capital to wage labor we shall present briefly the most general conditions which come into consideration in the determination of wages wages as we have seen are the price of a certain commodity labor power wages therefore are determined by the same laws that determine the price of every other commodity the question then is how is the price of a commodity determined chapter 3 by what is the price of a commodity determined by the competition between the buyers and sellers by the relation of the demand to supply of the call to the offer the competition by which the price of a commodity is determined is threefold the same commodity is offered for sale by various sellers whoever sells commodities of same quality most cheaply is sure to drive the other sellers from the field and to secure the greatest market for himself the sellers therefore fight among themselves for the sales for the market each one of them wishes to sell and to sell as much as possible and if possible to sell alone to the exclusion of all the other sellers each one sells cheaper than the other thus there takes a place a competition among the sellers which forces down the price of the commodities offered by them but there is also competition among the buyers this causes the price of the proffered commodities to rise finally there is a competition between the buyers and the sellers those wish to purchase as cheaply as possible those to sell as dearly as possible the result of this competition between buyers and the sellers will depend upon the relations between the two above mentioned camps of competitors that is upon whether the competition in the army of the seller is stronger industry leads two great armies in the field against each other and each of these gains is engaged in battle among its own troops in its own ranks the army among whose troops there is less fighting 
carries off the victory over the other opposing host. Let us suppose that there are 100 bales of cotton in the market and at the same time purchasers for the 1000 bales of cotton. In this case, the demand is 10 times greater than the supply. Competition among the buyers then will be very strong. Each of them tries to get the hold of one bale if possible of the whole 100 bales. This example is not in arbitrary supposition. In the history of commerce, we have experienced period of scarcity of cotton, when some capitalists united together and sought to buy up not the 100 bills but the whole cotton supply of the world. In the given case, then one buyer seeks to drive the others from the field by offering a relatively higher price for the bales of cotton. The cotton sellers, who perceive the troops of the enemy in the most violent contention among themselves and who therefore are fully assured of the sale of their whole 100 bales, will be aware of pulling one another's hair in order to force down the price of the curtain at the very moment in which their opponent race with one another to screw it up high. So all of a sudden, peace resigns in the army of sailors. They stand opposed to the buyers like one man, fold their arms in the philosophic contentment and their claims would find no limit did not the offers of limit even the most importunity of buyers have a very definite limit. If then the supply of the commodity is less than the demand for it, competition among the seller is very slight or there may be none at all among them. In the same proportion in which this competition decreases, the competition among the buyer increases. Result, more or less considerable rises in the price of the commodities. It is well known that the opposite case with the opposite results happen even more frequently. Great excess of supply over demand, desperate competition among the sellers and lack of buyers force the sales of the commodity at ridiculously low prices. But what is a rise and what a fall of prices? What is a high and what is a low price? A grain of sand is high when examined through microscope and a tower is low when compared with a mountain. And if the price is determined by the relation of supply and demand, by what is the relation of supply and demand determined? Let us turn to the first worthy citizens we meet. He will not hesitate one moment but like Alexander the Great will cut his metaphysical knot with the multiplication table. He will say to us, if the production of the commodities which has cost me 100 pounds and out of the sale of these goods I make 110 pounds within a year, you understand, that's an honest, sound, reasonable profit. But if in exchange I receive 120 or 130 pounds, that's a higher profit. And if I should get as much as 200 pounds, that would be an extraordinary and enormous profit. What is it, then, that serves this citizen as the standard of his profit, the cost of production of his commodities? If in exchange for these goods he receives a quantity of other goods whose production has cost less, he has lost. If he receives in the exchange for his goods a quantity of other goods whose production has cost more, he has gained and he reckons the falling or the rising of the profit according to the degree at which exchange value of these goods stands whether above or below his zero, the cost of production. We have seen how the changing relation of supply and demand causes now a rise, now a fall of prices, now high, now low prices. If the price of the commodity rises considerably owing to a failing supply or a disproportionately growing demand, then the price of some other commodity must have fallen in the proportion. For of course, the price of the commodity only expresses in the money the proportion in which other commodities will be given in the exchange for it. If, for example, the price of a yard of silk rises from 2 to 3 dollars, the price of silver has fallen in relation to the silk and in the same way the prices of all the other commodities whose prices have remained stationary have fallen in relation to the price of silk. A large quantity of them must be given in exchange in order to obtain the same amount of silk. Now, what will be the consequence of a rise in the price of the particular commodity? A mass of capital will be thrown into the prosperous branch of the industry, and this immigration of capital into the provinces of the favored industry will continue until it yields no more than the customary profits, or rather, until the price of its products, owning to the overproduction, sinks below the cost of production. Conversely, if the price of the commodity falls below its cost of production, the capital will be withdrawn from the products of this commodity, except in the case of a branch of industry which has become obsolete and is therefore doomed to disappear, the production of such commodity will, owning to its flight of capital, continue to decrease until it corresponds to the demand, 
and the price of the commodity rises again to the level of its cost of production or rather until the supply has fallen below the demand and its price has risen above its cost of production for the current price of a commodity is always either above or below its cost of production we see how capital continually migrates out of the province of one industry and immigrates into that of another the high price produces an excessive immigration and the low price an excessive immigration we could so from one other point of view how not only the supply but also the demand is determined by the cost of production but this will lead us too far away from the subject we have just seen how the fluctuation of supply and demand always bring the price of commodity back to its cost of production the actual price of a commodity indeed stands always above or below the cost of production but the rise and fall reciprocally balance each other so that within a certain period of time if the ebbs and the flows of the industry are reckoned up together the commodities will be exchanged for one another in accordance with the cost of production their price is thus determined by the cost of production the determination of price by the cost of production is not to be understood in the sense of bourgeoisie economists the economists say that the average price of the commodities equals to the cost of production that is the law the anarchic moment in which the rise is compensated for by a fall and the fall by a rise they regard as an accident we might just as well consider the fluctuations as the law and the determination of the price by the cost of production as an accident as is in fact done by certain other economists but it is precisely these fluctuations which viewed more closely carry the most frightful devastation in their train and like an earthquake causes bourgeoisie society to shake its very foundations it is precisely these fluctuations that force the price to conform to the cost of production in the totality of this disorderly moment is to be found its order in the total course of this industrial anarchy in this circular moment competition balances as it were the one extravagance by the other we thus see that the price of a commodity is indeed determined by its cost of production but in such a manner that the periods in which the price of these commodities rises above the cost of production are balanced by the periods in which it sinks below the cost of production and vice versa of course this does not hold good for a single given product of an industry but only for that branch of the industry so also it does not hold good for an individual manufacturer but only for the whole class of manufacturers the determination of price by the cost of production is stand amount to the determination of the price by the labor time required to the production of the commodity for the cost of production consists first of raw materials and wear and tear of tools etc that is of industrial products whose production has cost a certain number of work days which therefore represent a certain amount of labor time and secondly of direct labor which is also measured by its duration chapter 4 by what are wages determined now the same general laws which regulate the price of commodities in general naturally regulate wages or the price of labor power wages will now rise now fall according to the relation of the supply and demand according as competition shifts itself between the buyer of the labor power the capitalist and the sellers of labor power the workers the fluctuation of wages correspond to the fluctuation in the price of commodities in general but within the limits of these fluctuations the price of labor power will be determined by the cost of production by labor time necessary for the production of this commodity labor power what then is the cost of production of labor power it is the cost required for the maintenance of the laborer as a laborer and for his education and training as a laborer therefore the shorter the time required for the training up to a particular sort of work the smaller is the cost of production of the worker the lower is the price of his labor power his wages in those branches of industry in which any period of apprenticeship is necessary and the mere bodily existence of the worker is sufficient the cost of production is limited almost exclusively to the commodities necessary for keeping him in working condition the price of his work will therefore be determined by the price of necessary means of subsistence here however there enters another consideration the manufacturer who calculates his cost of production and in accordance with it the price of the product takes into an account the wear and tear of the instruments of labor 
if the machine costs him, for example, $1,000 and this machine is used up in the 10 years, he adds $100 annually to the price of the commodities in order to be able, after 10 years, to replace the worn out machine with a new one. In the same manner, the cost of production of simple labor power must include the cost of propagation, by means of which the race of workers is enabled to multiply itself and to replace worn out workers with new ones. The wear and tear of the workers, therefore, is calculated in the same manner as the wear and tear of the machine. Thus, the cost of production of simple labor power amounts to the cost of the existence and propagation of the worker. The price of this cost of existence and propagation constitute wages. The wages thus determined are called minimum of wages. This minimum wage, like the determination of the price of commodities in general by cost of production, does not hold good for the single individual but only for the race. Individual workers, indeed millions of workers do not receive enough to be able to exist and propagate themselves but the wages of whole working class adjust themselves within the limits of their fluctuations to this minimum. Now that we have come to an understanding in the regard to the most general laws which govern wages as well as the price of every other commodity, we can examine our subject more particularly. Chapter 5 the nature and growth of capital. Capital consists of raw materials, instruments of labor, and means of subsistence of all kinds, which are employed in producing new materials, new instruments, and new means of subsistence. All these components of capital are created by the labor, products of labor, accumulated labor. Accumulated labor that serves as a means to a new production is capital. So say the economists, what is a Negro slave? a man of a black race, the one explanation is worthy of the other. The Negro is a Negro. Only under certain conditions does he become a slave. A cotton spinning machine is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain conditions does it become capital. Torn away from these conditions, it is little capital as gold is itself money or sugar is the price of the sugar. In the process of production, Human beings work not only upon the nature but also upon one another. They produce only by working together in a specified manner and reciprocally exchanging their activities. In order to produce, they enter into definite connections and relations to one another. And only within these social connections and relations does their influence upon nature operate, that is, does production take place. These social relations between the producers and the conditions under which they access their activities and share in the total act of production will naturally vary according to the character of the means of production. With the discovery of new instrument of warfare, the firearm, the whole internal organization of the army was necessarily altered. The relations with which the individuals compose an army and can work as an army were transformed, and the relation of different armies to one another was likewise changed. We thus see that the social relations within which individuals produce, the social relations of productions are altered, transformed, with the change and development of the material means of production, of the forces of production. The relations of production in their totality constitute what is called the social relations, society, and moreover a society at a definite stage of historical development, a society with peculiar distinctive characteristics, ancient society, feudal society, bourgeoisie society, are such totalities of relation of production, each of which denotes a particular stage of development in the history of mankind. Capital also is a social relation of the production. It is a bourgeoisie relation of production, a relation of production of bourgeoisie society. The means of subsistence, the instruments of labor, the raw materials of which the capital consists, have they not been produced and accumulated under the given social conditions within the definite social relations? Are they not employed for new production under the given special conditions within a definite social relations? And does not just definite social characters stamp the products which serve for the new production as capital? Capital consists not only of the means of subsistence, instruments of labor, and raw materials, not only as a material products, it consists just as much of exchange values, all products of which it consists are commodities. Capital, consequently, is not only a sum of material products, it is a sum of commodities, of exchange values, of social magnitude. Capital remains the same whether we put cotton in the place of wool, rice in the place of wheat, steamships in the place of railroads, provided only that the cotton, the rice, the steamships, 
the body of the capital have the same exchange value the same price as the wool the weight the railroads in which it was previously embodied the bodily form of capital may transfer itself continually while the capital does not suffer the least alterations but through every capital is a sum of commodities that is of exchange values it does not follow that every sum of commodities of exchange values is capital every sum of exchange values is an exchange value each particular exchange value is a sum of exchange values for example a house worth $1000 is an exchange value of $1000 a piece of paper worth 1 cent is a sum of exchange values of 100 100 of a cent products which are exchangeable for the others are commodities the definite proportion in which they are exchangeable forms their exchange value or expressed in money their price the quantity of these products can have no effect on their characters as commodities as representing an exchange value as having a certain price whether a tree be a large or a small it remains a tree whether we exchange the iron in the cent weights or in the hundred weights for the other products does this alter its character its being a commodity or exchange value according to the quantity it is the commodity of a greater or of lesser value of higher or of lower price how then does a sum of commodities of exchange value become capital thereby that as an independent social power that is as the power of part of a society it preserves itself and multiplies by exchange with direct living labor power the existence of class which possesses nothing but the ability to work is a necessary presupposition of capital it is only the dominion of past accumulated materialized labor over immediate living labor that stamps the accumulated labor with the character of capital capital does not consist in the fact that accumulated labor serves living labor as a means for new production it consists in the fact that living labor serves accumulated labor as the means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value chapter 6 relation of wage labor to capital what is it that takes place in the exchange between the capitalist and the wage laborer the laborer receive means of subsistence in exchange for his labor power the capitalist receive in exchange for his means of subsistence labor the productive activity of the laborer the creative force by which the workers not only replaces what he consumes but also gives to the accumulated labor a greater value than it previously possessed the laborer gets from the capitalist a portion of the existing means of subsistence for what purpose do this means of subsistence serves him for immediate consumption but as soon as i consume means of subsistence they are irrevocably lost to me unless i employ the time during which this means sustains my life in producing new means of subsistence in creating by my labor new values in place of values lost in the consumption but it is just this novel reproductive power that the laborer surrenders to the capitalist in exchange for means of subsistence received consequently he has lost it for himself let us take an example for 1 dollar to a laborer works all day long in the fields of a farmer to whom he thus secures a return of 2 dollars the farmer not only receives the replaced value of which he has given to a day laborer he has doubled it therefore he has consumed the 1 dollar that he gave to the day laborer in a fruitful productive manner for the 1 dollar he has bought from the labor power of the day laborer which creates products of the swell of twice the value and out of 1 dollar makes 2 the day laborer on the contrary receives in the place of its productive force whose results he has just surrendered to the farmer 1 dollar which he exchanges for the means of subsistence which he consumes more or less quickly the 1 dollar has therefore been consumed in a double manner reproductively for the capitalist for it has been exchanged for the labor power which brought forth 2 dollars unproductively for the worker for it has just been exchanged for the means of subsistence which are lost forever and whose value he can obtain again by only repeating the same exchange with the farmer the capital therefore presupposes wage labor wage labor presupposes capital they condition each other each brings the other into existence does a worker in a cotton factory produces only cotton no he produces capital he produces values which serve a new to command his work and to create by means of it new values capital can multiply itself only by exchanging itself for labor power by calling wage labor into life 
the labor power of the wage laborer can exchange itself for capital only by increasing capital by strengthening that very power whose slave it is increase of capital therefore is increase of the proletariat that is of working class and so the bourgeoisie and its economists maintain that the interest of the capitalist and of the laborer is the same and in fact so they are the worker perishes if the capital does not keep him busy the capital perishes if it does not exploit the labor power which in order to exploit it must buy the more quickly the capital destined for the production the productive capital the more quickly the capital destined for the production the productive capital increases the more prosperous the industry is the more the bourgeoisie enriches themselves the better business gets so more workers does the capitalist need so much the dearer does the worker sell himself the fastest possible growth of the productive capital is therefore the indispensable condition for a tolerable life to the laborer but what is growth of the productive capital the growth of the power of accumulated labor over living labor growth of the rule of the bourgeoisie over the working class when the wage labor produces the alien wealth dominating it the power hostile to it capital flow back to it its means of the employment that is its means of subsistence under the condition that it again become a part of capital that is become again the label whereby capital is to be forced into an accelerated expensive movement to say that the interest of the capital and the interest of the workers are identical signifies only this that capital and the wage labor are two sides of one and the same relation the one conditions the other in the same way that the usurer and the borrower condition each other as long as the wage laborer remains a wage laborer his lot is dependent upon the capital that is what the boasted community of interest between workers and the capitalist amounts to if capitalist grows the mass of wage labor grows the number of wage workers increases the sway of capital extends over a greater mass of individuals let us suppose the most favorable case if productive capital grows the demand for the labor grows it therefore increases the price of labor power wages a house may be large or small as long as the neighboring houses are likewise small it satisfies all the social requirement for a residence but let there arise next to the little house a palace and the little house shrinks to a hut the little house now makes it clear that its inmate has no social position at all to maintain or but a very insignificant one and however high it may shoot up in the course of civilization if the neighboring palace rises in the equal or even in the greater measure the occupant of the relatively little house will always find himself more uncomfortable more dissatisfied more cramped within his four walls an appreciable rise in the wages presupposes a rapid growth of productive capital rapid growth of productive capital calls forth just as a rapid a growth of wealth of luxury of social needs and social pleasures therefore although the pleasures of the laborer have increased the social gratification which they afford has fallen in the comparison with the increased pleasures of the capitalist which are inaccessible to the worker in comparison with the stage of development of the society in general our wants and pleasures have their origin in society we therefore measure them in relation to society we do not measure them in relation to the objects which serve for their gratification since they are of a social nature they are of a relative nature but wages are not at all determined merely by the sum of commodities for which they may be exchanged other factors enter into the problem what the workers directly receive for their labor power is a certain sum of money are wages determined merely by this money price in the 16th century the gold and silver circulation in europe increased in consequence of the discovery of richer and more easily worked mines in america the value of gold and silver therefore fell in relation to other commodities the workers received the same amount of coin silver for their labor power as before the money price of their work remained the same and yet their wages had fallen for in exchange for the same amount of silver they obtained of a smaller amount of other commodities this was one of the circumstances which furthered the growth of capital and the rise of the bourgeoisie in the 18th century let us take another case in the winter of 1847 in consequence of the bad harvest the most indispensable means of subsistence grains meat butter cheese etc rose greatly in price let us suppose that the workers still receive the same sum of money for their labor power as before did not their wages fall to be sure for the same money they received in exchange less bread meat etc their wages fell 
not because of the value of the silver was less but because the value of the means of subsistence had increased finally let us suppose that the money price of labor power remained the same while all agricultural and manufactured commodities had fallen in price because of the employment of new machines of favorable seasons etc for the same money the workers could now buy more commodities of all kinds their wages have therefore risen just because their money value has not changed the money price of labor power the nominal wages do not therefore coincide with the actual or real wages that is with the amount of commodities which are actually given in exchange for the wages if then we speak of a rise and fall of wages we have to keep in mind not only the money price of the labor power the nominal wages but also the real wages but neither the nominal wages that is the amount of the money for which the laborer sells himself to the capitalist nor the real wages the amount of the commodities which he can buy for his money adjust the relations which are comprehended in terms of wages wages are determined above all by their relations to the gain the profit of the capitalist in other words wages are proportionate real wages express the price of labor power in relation to the price of commodities relative wages on the other hand express the share of immediate labor in the value newly created by it in relation to the share of it which falls to the accumulated labor to capital chapter 7 the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profits we have said wages are not a share of the worker in the commodities produced by him wages are that part of already existing commodities with which the capitalist buys a certain amount of productive labor power but the capitalist must replace these wages out of the price for which he sells the product made by the worker he must so replace it that as a rule there remains to him a surplus above the cost of production expended by him that is he must get a profit the selling price of a commodities produced by the worker is divided from the point of view of the capitalist into three parts first the replacement of the price of raw materials advanced by him in addition to the replacement of the wear and tear of the tools machine and other instruments of labor likewise advanced by him second the replacement of the wages advanced and third the surplus left over that is the profit of the capitalist while the first part merely replaces the previously existing values it is evident that the replacement of the wages and surplus are as a whole taken out of the new value which is produced by the labor of the worker and added to the raw materials and in this sense we can view wages as well as profit for the purpose of comparing them with each other as shares in the product of the worker real wages may remain the same they may even rise Nevertheless their relative wages may fall let us suppose for instance that all the means of subsistence have fallen 2/3 in price while the day wages have fallen but 1/3 for example from 3 to 2 dollars although the worker can now get a greater amount of commodities with these 2 dollars than he formerly did with the 3 dollars yet his wages have decreased in proportion to the gain of the capitalist the profit of the capitalist the manufacturers for instance has increased 1 dollar which means that for a smaller amount of exchange values which he pays to the worker the latter must produce a greater amount of exchange values than before the share of capitals in proportion to the share of labor has risen the distribution of social wealth between capital and labor has become still more unequal the capitalist commands a greater amount of labor with the same capital the power of the capitalist class over the working class has grown the social position of worker has become worse has been forced down still another degree below that of the capitalist what then is the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profit in their reciprocal relation they stand in inverse proportion to each other the share of profit increases in the same proportion in which the share of labor wages falls and vice versa profit rises in the same degree in which wages fall it falls in the same degree in which wages rise it might perhaps be argued that capitalist class can gain by advantageous exchange of his products with another capitalist by a rise in the demand for his commodities whether in consequence of the opening up of new markets or in consequence of temporarily increased demands in the old market and so on that the profit of the capitalist therefore may be multiplied by taking advantage of other capitalist independently of the rise and fall in wages of the exchange value of labor power or that the profit of the capitalist may also rise through the improvements in the instruments of labor 
new applications of the forces of nature and so on. But in the first place, it must be admitted that the result remains the same, although brought about in an opposite manner. Profit, indeed, has not risen because wages have fallen, but wages have fallen because profit has risen. With the same amount of another man's labor, the capitalist has brought a larger amount of exchange values without having paid more for the labor on the account, that is, the work is paid for less in proportion to the net gain which it yields to the capitalist. In the second place, it must be borne in mind that, despite the fluctuations in the prices of the commodities, the average price of every commodity, the proportion in which it exchanges for the other commodities is determined by its cost of production. The acts of overreaching and taking advantage of one another within the capitalist ranks necessarily equalizes themselves. The improvements of machinery, the new applications of the forces of nature in the service of production make it possible to produce in a given period of time, with the same amount of labor and capital, a larger amount of products, but in no wise a larger amount of exchange values. If by the use of the spinning machine, I can furnish twice as much as yarn in an hour as before its invention, for instance, 100 pounds instead of 50 pounds, in the long run, I receive back in exchange for this 100 pounds no more commodities than I did before for the 50, because the cost of production has fallen by half, or because I can furnish double the product at the same cost. Finally, in whatsoever proportion the capitalist class, whether of one country or of the entire world market, distribute the net revenue of production among themselves, the total amount of this net revenue always consists exclusively of the amount by which the accumulated labor has been increased from the proceeds of direct labor. This whole amount, therefore, grows in the same proportion in which labor augments capital, that is, in the same proportion in which profit rises as compared with wages. Chapter 8 The Interest of Capital and Wage Labor are diametrically opposed effect of growth of productive capital on wages. We thus see that even if we keep ourselves within the relation of capital and wage labor, the interest of capitals and the interest of wage labor are diametrically opposed to each other. A rapid growth of capital is synonymous with the rapid growth of profits. Profits can grow rapidly only when the price of the labor, the relative wages, decrease just as rapidly. Relative wages may fall, although the real wages rise simultaneously with nominal wages. With the money value of labor, provided only that the real wages do not rise in the same proportion as profit. If, for instance, in good business years wages rise 5% while the profit rise 30%, the proportional, the relative wage has not increased but decreased. If, therefore, the income of the work increased with the rapid growth of capital, there is at the same time a widening of social chasm that divides the worker from the capitalist, an increase in the power of capital over the labor, a greater dependence of labor upon capital. To say that the worker has an interest in the rapid growth of capital means only this, that the more speedily the worker augments the wealth of the capitalist, the larger will be the crumbs which falls to them, the greater will be the number of workers that can be called into the existence the more can be the mass of slaves dependent upon capital be increased. We have thus seen that even the most favorable situation for the working class, namely the most rapid growth of capital, however much it may improve the material life of the worker, does not abolish the antagonism between his interest and the interest of the capitalist. Profit and wages remain as before in inverse proportion. If capital grows rapidly, wages may rise but the profit of capital rises disproportionately faster. The material position of the worker has improved, but at the cost of his social position. The social chasm that separates him from the capitalist has widened. Finally, to say that the most favorable condition for wage labor is the fastest possible growth of productive capital is the same as to say, the quicker the working class multiplies and arguments the power inimical to it, the wealth of another which loads over the class, the more favorable will be the conditions under which it will be permitted to dwell anew at a multiplication of bourgeoisie wealth. At the enlargement of the power of capital, content thus to forgo for itself the golden chains by which the bourgeoisie drags it in its train. Growth of productive capital and the rise of wages, are they really so indissolubly united as the bourgeoisie economists maintain?
we must not believe their mere words. We dare not to believe them even when they claim that the fatter capital is more will its slave be pampered. The bourgeoisie is too much enlightened. It keeps its accounts much too carefully to share the prejudices of feudal lord who makes an ostentatious display of the magnificence of his retinue. The conditions of existence of the bourgeoisie compel it to attend carefully to its bookkeeping. We must therefore examine more closely into the following questions. In what manner does the growth of productive capital affect wages? If as a whole the productive capital of the bourgeoisie society grows, there takes place a more many-sided accumulation of labor. The individual capitals increase in the number and in magnitude. The multiplications of individual capitals increases the competition among the capitalists. The increasing magnitude of increasing capitals provides the means of leading more powerful armies of workers with more gigantic instrument of war upon the industrial battlefield. The one capitalist can derive the other from the field and carry off his capital only by selling more cheaply. In order to sell more cheaply without ruining himself, he must produce more cheaply. That is, increase the productive forces of labor as much as possible. But the productive forces of labor is increased above all by a greater division of labor and by more general introduction and constant improvement of machinery. The larger the army of workers among whom the labor is subdivided, the more gigantic the scale upon which the machinery is introduced, the more in proportion does the cost of production decrease, the more fruitful is the labor. And so there arises among the capitalists a universal rivalry for the increase of the division of labor and of machinery and for their exploitation upon the greatest possible scale. If now, by a greater division of labor, by the application and improvement of new machines, by a more advantageous exploitation of the forces of nature on a larger scale, a capitalist has found the means of producing with the same amount of labor a larger amount of products of commodities than his competitors. If, for instance, he can produce a whole yard of linen in the same labor time in which his competitors weave of half a yard, how will this capitalist act? He could keep on selling half a yard of linen at old market price, but this would not have the effect of driving his opponents from the field and enlarging his own market. But his need of a market has increased in the same measure in which his productive power has extended. The more powerful and costly means of production that he has called into existence enable him, it is true, to sell his wares more cheaply, but they compel him at the same time to sell more wares to get control of a very much greater market for his commodities. Consequently, this capitalist will sell his half yard of linen more cheaply than his competitors. But the capitalist will not sell the whole yard so cheaply as his competitors sell the half yard. Although the production of the whole yard cost him no more than does that of the half yard to the others. Otherwise, he would make no extra profit and would get back into exchange only the cost of production. He might obtain a greater income from having set in motion a larger capital, but not from having made a greater profit on his capital than the others. Moreover, he attains the object he is aiming at if he prices his goods only a small percentage lower than his competitors. He drives them off the field, he rests from them at least the part of their market by underselling them. And finally, let us remember that the current price always stands either above or below the cost of production. According as the scale of commodity takes place in the favorable or unfavorable period of industry, according as the market price of the yard of linen stands above or below its former cost of production, will the percentage vary at which the capitalist who has made use of the new and more faithful means of production sell above his real cost of production. But the privilege of our capitalist is not of long duration. Other competing capitalists introduce the same machines, the same division of labor, and introduce them upon the same or even upon a greater scale. And finally, this introduction becomes so universal that the price of the linen is lowered not only below its old, but even below its new cost of production. The capitalists therefore find themselves in their mutual relation in the same situation in which they were before, the introduction of the new means of production. And if they are by this means enabled to offer double the product at the old price, they are now forced to furnish double the product for the less than the old price. Having arrived at the new point, the new cost of production, the battle for supremacy in the market has to be fought out anew. 
given more division of labor and more machinery and there results a greater scale upon which division of labor and machinery are exploited and competition again brings the same reaction against this result chapter 9 effect of capitalist competition on the capitalist class the middle class and the working class we thus see how the method of production and the means of production are constantly enlarged revolutionized how division of labor necessarily draws after it greater division of labor the employment of machinery greater employment of machinery work upon a large scale work upon a still greater scale this is the law that continually throws capitalist production out of its old roots and compels capital to strain ever more the productive forces of labor for the very reason that it has already strained them the law that grants it no respite and constantly shouts in the year march march This is no other law than that which within the periodical fluctuation of commerce necessarily adjusts the price of commodity to its cost of production no matter how powerful the means of production which a capitalist may bring into the field the competition will make their adoption general and from the moment that they have been generally adopted the sole result of the greater productiveness of his capital will be that he must furnish at the same price 10 20 100 times as much as before but since he must find a market for perhaps 1000 times as much in order to outweigh the lower selling price by the greater quantity of the sale since now a more extensive sale is necessary not only to gain a greater profit but also in order to replace the cost of production and since this more extensive sale has become a question of life and death not only for him but also for his rivals the old struggle must begin again and it is all the more violent and more powerful the means of production already invented are the division of labor and the application of machinery will therefore take a fresh start and open an even greater scale whatever be the power of the means of production which are employed competition seeks to rob the capital of the golden fruits of this power by reducing the price of the commodities to the cost of production in the same measure in which the production is cheapened that is in the same measure in which more can be produced with the same amount of labor it compels by a law which is irresistible a still greater cheapening of production the sale of ever greater masses of the product for smaller prices thus the capitalist will have gained nothing more by his efforts than the obligation to furnish a greater product in the same labor time in a word more difficult conditions for the profitable employment of his capital while competition therefore constantly pursues him with its law of the cost of production and turns against himself every weapon that he forges against his rivals the capitalist continually seeks to get the best of the competition by restlessly introducing further subdivision of the labor and new machines which though more expensive enable him to produce more cheaply instead of waiting until the new machines shall have been rendered obsolete by the competition if we now conceive this feverish agitation as it operates in the market of the whole world we shall be in the position to comprehend how growth accumulation and concentration of the capital bring in their train and ever more details of division of labor and ever greater improvement of old machines and a constant application of new machine a process which goes on uninterruptedly with feverish haste and upon an ever more gigantic scale but what effect do these conditions which are inseparable from the growth of productive capital have upon the determination of wages the greater division of labor enables one laborer to accomplish the work of 5 10 or 20 laborers it therefore increases competition among the laborers 5 fold 10 fold or 20 fold the laborers compete not only by selling themselves one cheaper than other but also by one doing the work of 5 10 or 20 and they are forced to compete in this manner by division of labor which is introduced and steadily improved by the capital furthermore to the same degree in which the division of labor increases is the labor simplified the special skill of the laborer becomes worthless he becomes transformed into a simple monotonous force of production with neither physical nor mental elasticity his work becomes accessible to all therefore competitors press upon him from all sides moreover it must be remembered that the more simple the more easily learned the work is so much the less is its cost of production the expense of its acquisition and so much the lower must the wages sink for like the price of any other commodity they are determined by the cost of production therefore in the same manner in which the labor becomes more unsatisfactory more repulsive do competition increase and wages decrease
the laborer seeks to maintain the total of his wages for a given time by more labor either by working a great number of hours or by accomplishing more in the same number of hours thus or on by want he himself multiplies the disastrous effects of division of labor the result is the more he works the less wages he receives and for this simple reason the more he works the more he competes against his fellow workmen the more he compels them to work against him and to offer themselves on the same wretched condition as he does so that in the last analysis he competes against himself as a member of the working class the machinery produces the same effects but upon a much larger scale it supplies skilled laborers by unskilled men by women adults by children were newly introduced it throws workers upon the streets in great masses and as it becomes more highly developed and more productive it discards them in additional though small numbers we have hastily sketched in broad outlines the industrial war of capitalist among themselves this war has the peculiarity that the battles in it are won less by recruiting than by discharging the army of workers the generals the capitalist vie with one another as to who can discharge the greatest number of industrial soldiers the economist tells us to be sure that those laborers who have been rendered superfluous by machinery finds new ventures of employment they dare not assert directly that the same laborers that have been discharged find new situations in new branches of the labor facts cry out too loudly against this lie strictly speaking they only maintain that new means of employment will be found for the other sections of the working class for example for the portion of the young generation of the laborers who were about to enter upon the branch of the industry which had just been abolished of course this is a great satisfaction to disabled laborers there will be no lack of fresh exploitable blood and muscle for the measures capitalist the dead may bury their dead this consolation seems to be intended more for the comfort of the capitalist themselves than their laborers if the whole class of the wage laborer were to be annihilated by the machinery how terrible that would be for the capital which without wages labor ceases to be the capital but even if we assume that all who are directly forced out of the employment by the machinery as well as all the rising generation who were waiting for a chance of employment in the same branch of industry do actually find some new employment are we to believe that this new employment will pay as high wages as did the one they have lost if it did it would be in contradiction to the laws of political economy we have seen how modern industry always tend to be substitution of the simpler and more subordinate employments for the higher and more complex ones how then could a mass of workers thrown out of one branch of the industry by machinery find refuge in another branch unless they were to be paid more poorly an exception to the law has been adopted namely the workers who are employed in the manufacture of the machinery itself as soon as there is in industry a greater demand for and a greater consumption of machinery it is said that the number of machines must necessarily increase consequently also the manufacture of machines consequently also the employment of workers in machine manufacture and the workers employed in this branch of industry are skilled even educated workers since the year of 1840 this assertion which even before the date was only half true has lost all its semblance of truth for the most diverse machines are now applied to the manufacture of the machines themselves on quite as extensive a scale as in the manufacture of cotton yarn and the laborers employed in the machine factories can but play the role of very stupid machines alongside of the highly ingenious machines but in place of the man who has been dismissed by the machine the factory may employ perhaps three children and a woman and must not the wages of the man have previously sufficed for the three children and one woman must not the minimum wages have sufficed for the preservation and propagation of the race what then do this beloved bourgeoisie phrase prove nothing more than that now four times as many as workers lives are used up as there were previously in order to obtain the livelihood of one working family to sum up the more productive capital grows the more it extends the division of labor and the application of machinery the more the division of labor and the application of machinery extend the more does the competition extend among the workers the more do their wages shrink together in addition the working class is also recruited from the higher strata of society a mass of small businessmen and of people living upon the interest of their capital is precipitated into the ranks of the working class 
and they will have nothing else to do than to stretch out their arms alongside of the arms of the workers. Thus the forest of outstretched arms begging for work grows even thicker while the arms themselves grow every leaner. It is evident that the small manufacturer cannot survive in a struggle in which the first condition of success is production upon an ever greater scale. It is evident that the small manufacturer cannot at the same time be a big manufacturer, that the interest on capital decreases in the same ratio in which the mass and the number of capitals increase, that it diminishes with the growth of capital, that therefore the capitalist can no longer live on his interest but must consequently throw himself upon the industry by joining the ranks of the small manufacturers and thereby increasing the number of candidates for the proletariat. All this requires no further elucidation. Finally, in the same measure in which the capitalists are compelled by the moment described above to explore the already existing gigantic means of production on an ever-increasing scale and for this purpose to set in motion all the mainsprings of credit in the same measures do they increase the industrial earthquakes in the midst of which the commercial world can preserve itself only by sacrificing a portion of its wealth its products and even its forces of production to the god of the lower world in short the crisis increases they become more frequent and more violent if for no other reason then for this alone, that in the same measure in which the mass of the product grows and therefore the needs for the extensive markets in the same measure does the world market shrink ever more and ever fewer the markets remain to be exploited. Since every previous crisis have subjected to the commerce of the world a hitherto unconquered or but superficially exploited market. But capital not only lives upon labor like a master at once distinguished and barbarous, it drags with it into its grave the course of its slaves, whole hecatombs of workers who perish in this cry. We thus see that if capital grows rapidly, competition among the workers grows with even greater rapidity. That is, the means of employment and subsistence for the working class decrease in proportion even more rapidly. But this notwithstanding, the rapid growth of the capital is the most favorable condition for wage labor.